Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today with old friend Cisco McSorley, a state senator for uh, 17 years, since 1997. Uh, we're here on Insight New Mexico in the uh, New Mexico Mercury Library. We're going to talk today about something that has, I think, a lot of New Mexicans, if not confused, at least concerned about what's going to happen at the 60-day session in, at the state legislature beginning in January. We've all been sort of reeling from this last midterm election, and there's a lot of new new wrinkles in the way the game is going to be played, particularly a, a, a Republican House. Well, I've always considered uh, uh, Cisco a pal, and, and, um, and I've always admired how he's handled himself in the legislature all these years. He's one of those straight arrows and straight shooters on our side that I think um, we really need more and more and more of. So it's a really a joy to have you with us, and uh, I can't wait to hear what we're going to talk about today. Thanks, VB. It means a lot to me that you say such nice things because um, you have spent your entire life trying to find the facts, trying to speak the truth, despite the odds, and for you to support me like that means a lot to me. So we know all of us are, how should I put it, a little dis discouraged. And, um, and a lot of that discouragement has to do with, with Citizen United. And I know you have some very specific views about this. So why don't we start our discussion with that broader context of what, of what the implications of, of Citizen United actually are right now? You're absolutely right. The elections have taken a dying philosophy and a dying party and um, Citizens United made them relevant. When it first was passed, they couldn't even call themselves Republicans, so they called themselves the Tea Partiers. Um, they got into power. They were incredibly disruptive and um, uh, did things that were uh, horrible for the United States and sent us backwards and contrary to the will of most Americans. But what we're seeing now is that slow and steady progress of money being even more meticulously uh, ingratiated into the public process. Because what we have now are politicians that are kowtowing to the corporations who receive virtually all of their money from people other there than their constituents. And it's now becoming the norm that politicians don't answer to their constituents, they answer to their corporate interests. A very good reason to be discouraged, as, as we all know. So this election, we saw a reversal in power structure in the New Mexico House. Uh, 34 to 37, I believe, used, used to be Democrats, or, or at least the last time around, now they're Republicans. What is this um, extra money and lack of relationship with constituents mean in the Republican House? It means that the Republicans themselves are terrified to vote their conscience. Over and over again, I hear Republicans tell me privately, oh, I like your bill, or I like this bill or that bill. I want to vote. My constituents want it. But if I vote for it, the corporate interests and the money people will oppose me for doing it. And um, that was the lesson they've learned in this last election. The swing in the House took place because of 2,400 votes in six and seven specific races. And that is what corporate influence will buy you. It basically buys seven houses, seven seats in the New Mexico legislature. And um, the, the only difference is going to be if during presidential years we can still generate enough interest with young people and with middle class people to really band together and fight for their own interests above corporate interests. So we know there's a coalition working already in the Senate uh, between some Republicans and, and Democrats. Do you think there's a potential for a coalition in the House of a similar sort? I don't think so. I already served in the House under another coalition. And in that coalition, we were able to finally break it because um, Republicans broke away from the lock, lockstep 
uh, agenda that they were supposed to follow because they knew it was not in their um, constituents' best interest. And as they broke away, this was before Citizens United, and there wasn't the kind of outside money that enabled those Republicans to be beaten. But we've seen it before. Uh, the best interest, the, be the best example was uh, gambling. You know, we had all this gambling money flood in under Johnson as he wanted uh, gambling in New Mexico. Yeah. And for years, the legislature was able to resist it. But after the third election cycle, we no longer had the votes to fight gambling. Pure money. Money interests can run um, legislatures like New Mexico. And it's relatively cheap for corporations to do it. So could you describe for us, uh, I know this is sort of basic government 101, but what happens when you have a Republican House and a Democratic Senate and a Republican in the executive branch? What What's the process that legislation has to take? Well, there's two words that really define what should happen in a traditional legislative body, bicameral body with House and Senate. Compromise and consensus. Nobody is going to get their way unless people give up the interests of their constituents and vote with money. And so the way the process is supposed to work is committees are, uh, uh, bills are introduced and they're sent to committees. And the committees are critical. A committee hearing is the only time anybody in the general public can come and say anything they want about any piece of legislation. The process becomes corrupted, though, if we start taking bills out of committee and sending them directly to the floor for a final vote without ever getting the public's input at, in those committees. So you can actually shut the general public out by taking bills out of committee. So while I don't think there's any hope right now for a coalition in the House, the question will be whether Democrats will be afraid of the last election results or stand by their principles and stand up for their constituents and stand strong for their constituents and keep their values. And if they do, they will vote against any kind of motion to take bills out of committee and send and thereby eliminating the general public's input and sending them directly to the floor of both the House and the Senate where the, the general public has no say. So uh, that that's very interesting, though, and it runs lots of different ways because right now we have a coalition in the Senate. But that coalition is in charge of the Senate, which means they hold the levers of power, mostly committee chairmanships. The committee chairs decide what bills are going to be heard and not heard, and they have the ultimate authority to decide um, what order these bills are heard in. Yeah. Just by slowing a bill down, that committee chairman can determine the bill's fate. It's going to die because there's not enough time in our legislative uh, setup. So if, we, if the governor tries to establish coalitions that upset the traditional legislative process by yanking bills out of committee without um, the consent of the chairman of the committee, that means you'll have to have some Democrats who have joined the coalition with the Republicans now voting against the, the, their own interests of the chairman that they helped put in power with the other Republicans. So it's not a black and white issue in the Senate. It gets to be real interesting as to whether or not the uh, so-called conservative Republicans and Democrats that run the Senate right now will actually... Uh, honor traditional legislative uh, prerogative and listen to the general public. So, if the if the Senate stays stays traditionally firm and and runs runs things th through the committee process, what happens if the House doesn't and it starts to send things right to the floor? What does that imply for the Senate? Well, it it's still unclear because we have never been in this position before. Whether or not the, the, the senators will recoil in horror at the House fast-tracking these bills and eliminating 
the ability of the general public to have input. So in the past, senators have always tried to, to honor tradition and honor legislative prerogatives. The irony about these changes where you blast bills out of committee, what in effect you are doing is destroying the very reason people become senators and, and House members. Do you become senators and House members just to get your own way? Or do you become senators and House members to honor the general public and listen to the general public? So the question is going to be whether or not senators keep to their traditional values of listening to the public and hearing the public in committee. So all of that procedural, incredibly interesting stuff aside, what will the big stories be, do you think, in, uh, in the 60-day session? And will we see the normal process of everybody huddling for 58 days until the last second and then, and then rush, rush whatever bill? So are we, we going to see a more aggressive action, do you think? Well, I do think the governor will try to be much more aggressive. Uh, but by her being aggressive... The last thing she wants is compromise and consensus and public input. Right. So if things start to flow through quickly, that means the governor is getting her way and usurping the process. If we take longer chances to hear the public right. and to deliberate and to try to find consensus and compromise, it'll all work out right at the end. Right. See, New Mexico has a very weak legislative system, and, and we have these short sessions for us to be able to come up with a budget and gather consensus on the great issues of the day in just 60 days yeah, is, is next to impossible. So I, I see the, the, if the whole process works and we use all the time we're given under the Constitution, I generally think we get better outcomes. Right. So whether or not that will happen, though, it's too early to tell. So what about the big stories? Well, so far... The governor has decided that the big story is right to work, although she never mentioned it in the campaign, none of her campaign ads. Uh, she says the other, we hear the other big issue is right to life, which she never said anything about. And the ironies of ironies, if you had to guess the 10 most pressing problems, we are now hearing from the governor that one of the biggest, most pressing problems that will require extra money is roads in southeastern New Mexico. Now, I had never realized <laughs> nobody in this campaign had ever mentioned roads in southeastern New Mexico as one of the top problems, but that's what the governor is saying. So the question will be whether she usurps the entire process like she did last year. Last year, she had her special water projects that she used to buy votes. To do that, she upset the entire process of the Water Trust Board and all the processes that had been put in place to try to determine the validity of a project, whether or not there was enough money to build it, whether there was enough engineering, all of those kinds of things were usurped. And certain projects were jumped ahead of others, projects that the local community themselves never even said they wanted or needed. So is she going to do the same thing to the road fund? Are we going to destroy all of the processes that we've tried to set up where the general public has a chance to come in and say, these are our biggest issues? Or is she just going to destroy all of that? And the question is, you know, for me, why should I be doing everything to exclude the general public for a governor who got 37,000 fewer votes this time than she did four years ago? If she's really that popular, she would have gotten more votes. But she didn't. She got fewer votes. People don't like her. They don't like whatever agenda th she thinks she stands for. Although in the um, election, there wasn't much of an agenda espoused. Yeah. So um, I don't see... I, I, I do believe in compromise. I do believe in trying to gather consensus. And I think on a lot of things, there are a lot of ways to do it. But there is a right way and a wrong way. And I'm not going to be bullied into the wrong way. We know that Secretary Scanderis still has her her moment uh, uh, in the icebox. It hasn't been broken yet. Uh, are these going to be pushed? I mean, I mean, is she really going to go after third graders uh, for not being able to read? Well, this idea of going after third graders is actually uh, uh, 
private interest and corporate money's big dream. They're the ones that we buy the tests from. And over an eight-year span, it's now been estimated this governor is going to spend a billion dollars on these tests. So not only do we have a problem with kids who can't take these tests and pass them because of the way the test is set up, not because of the ability of the teachers to teach, but um, then the governor's solution to all of this is hold these children back while they're given more instructional material that we have to buy from the very companies that give us the test so that over and over again we are taking public money and putting it into private hands and the irony about it is as i've said many times this company the park that produces this park test the biggest shareholders are the bush family and um it's no surprise uh scandera worked for jeb bush in florida uh, testing was one of the cornerstones of leaving no child left behind. How you determine whether or not teachers are any good is this test. And the irony about this test, again, is not just the involvement of the Bush family, but it's actually the subsidiaries, they're all subsidiaries of foreign companies. <laughs> so if are we going to take all of this private money and make them run our school boards on an international level? Or do we want to retain local control of our schools? It's so ironic that you have Tea Partiers who say they're for America, yet they vote for a governor who wants to turn over our educational system to a foreign company to determine the testing and the materials wow. that our children are u using in their schoolroom. We take away local control of the school board. Like, for instance, I was at a meeting the other night, and members of the school board could not tell the general public what the results would be if certain events took place, if parents refused um, to have their kids take the test. Local school board members couldn't even tell the general public what the results would be. In other words, it is the State Department. We are losing control of our local schools. It is now flowing to the State Department of Education here in New Mexico and Scandera, who then turns the power over to these international companies. I just heard the other day, and I won't mention any names, but that uh, uh, when Scandera came into power, she cut out numerous local uh, tutoring companies that had that had been devising uh, ways that were very successful to deal one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with, with the students who are, who are having a hard time with the system now. It seems to be a really ter terrible situation and pervasive. I guess what, what I'm now sort of wondering about is, is what are we going to see when it comes to water planning in this context? Um, we know that, um, that the public commons in education is being bled dry to, to, to feed the wallets and the bank accounts of big corporations here and international corporations. What's going to happen to our, our water supply? Are we going to see that same process happen here? There's some very controversial things happening in the Gila and uh, the Plains of St. Augustine um, and also out, out of Fort Sumner, uh, you know, where maybe eight or nine years ago they wanted to ship many many hundreds of thousands of, of, of acre feet to uh, Santa Fe. I may be exaggerating the number. But um, so, what, so what's going to happen, do you think? Well, I'm very concerned about water because the special interests within New Mexico have controlled water law, and we as a legislature have not represented people well by setting up clear boundaries as to what you can and can't do with water. Right. And in the absence of clear boundaries, we are losing huge water cases. For instance, we lost the Pecos River case, where Texas basically ran over us, right. and we owed hundreds of millions of acre feet of water to Texas that we've had to pay back. And the way you pay it back is you put thousands of farmers and ranchers off their land, and that land goes fallow. Now we have an Italian who owns an Italian company coming in wanting to drill uh, 12 water wells in the San Augustine Plains with huge 15-inch water pipes to take 
that water out of the San Augustine Plains and bring it into the Rio Grande. Now, they claim they want to do that so they can sell it to Albuquerque and Santa Fe, but really, there will be no stopping them selling it to the highest bidder in Texas once that is done. And we, we have no laws in New Mexico preventing it right now. And so the question is whether or not the state engineer who controls water in New Mexico will stand up to him. We actually had a, an engineer who I was worried about. I didn't even vote for him because he had represented some special interest in the water industry who had actually stood up and was saying, this isn't the way water law is supposed to work. And now the governor has gotten rid of him after just two years in office. He's gone. So I'm very concerned about who might be next. So, uh, and the interesting thing about this, and it's going to create real interesting fault lines, is uh, the overwhelming majority of water in New Mexico is used by ranchers and farmers, not by city people. Right. We'll survive. Santa Fe is already paying over $35 an acre foot for its water, far beyond what any rancher or farmer could afford. Yeah. So we'll survive. The, the, the urban centers will survive. It's the rest of the state, the rural parts of the state, that are going to suffer dramatically. And I think people in the rural areas are very unsettled, and they see it coming after what happened on the Pecos. They see it coming, and they're very worried about it. So we have to work together to try to solve this problem. And the question will be whether or not the corporations dictate the solution or whether or not the people of the state of New Mexico through their elected officials will dict dictate the solution. You hear rumors, of course, that, that Texas has $100 million put aside to fight us in, in the recent uh, suit over the Rio Grande and over our drilling allegedly too much out of the groundwater. Uh, we also know that Colorado is right on the verge right now of reservoiring and damming up its higher watersheds uh, not to prevent anybody from getting a drop more than they're supposed to get out of the Colorado Compact. We know Nevada has spent all of its own endless amounts of money. Arizona has a huge war chest too and we're sitting here you know pretending as if climate change isn't real and nothing's happening. I I'm terrified that we're just going to get run over, just going to get squashed and you're absolutely right I think. The people who are going to get squashed are the people who, who are in rural New Mexico, who are largely, almost exclusively, family farmers and family ranchers, except for the dairy industry, which is owned in another uh, by huge corporations as well. So, what's to be done about this? I think that what the general public should be watching is whether or not the legislature starts putting extra money in to uh, water rights determinations. Mm. Uh, right now, we have a huge suit going on with hundreds of thousands of um, people involved in the suit over what happens with the water in the lower Rio Grande. Right. Pretty much everything from um, about um, Elephant Butte to the, to the Texas border. Right. And whether or not there's going to be enough water that we identify as our own. See, part of the problem when we fight with out-of-state people and, and other states is that we can't even tell judges how much water we're using. And that's always been to the best interests of local special interests who are using far more water than their water rights allow or that they're ever telling anybody. And when we start to adjudicate water rights, we'll start to figure out who has what water rights. But in the long run, that helps us because then we can go to judges and say, Your Honor, this is how long these water rights have existed since the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that were recognized both Native American, Hispanic, and then existing Anglo water rights. And then the water rights that uh, were determined back in the 1920s will determine how much water each person is supposed to have, how much they're actually using, how much they're putting to this term beneficial use that you might know about, oh, yeah. and how much then is left for people downstream. If we don't know how much we're using, the folks downstream will use that against us sure. to take whatever they want to use first, and the judge will have no choice. So the first question will be, will the state finally st stand up and start putting money into water adjudication, which is an expensive, time-consuming process, but it has to be done 
because if it's not done, only out-of-state corporations and other states will benefit if we don't claim our own water. We know that uh, that the Interstate Stream Commission has just approved something on the Gila. We don't know what it actually approved. We know that they potentially have uh, 66 million bucks from the feds. We know that the broad estimate of the cost of this is something that's going to be built is half a billion to a billion dollars. Do you in your wildest dreams see the state legislature cough up a half a billion bucks uh, this legis- uh, uh, this session or, or down the road uh, for that kind of a project? Well, the promises that are being made is the New Mexico legislature doesn't have to cough up much money at all. It's all federal money. And oh, by the way, don't worry, it's there, no problem. Let the feds pay for it all, like they've traditionally paid for big water projects in the past, the Hoover Dams and the Grand Coulee Dams, etc. But, you know, it had seemed to be a growing consensus in this nation starting about 20 years ago that the era of big water projects was over, that um, they didn't really help local water users. They weren't good for the environment and the ecology. And so we needed to find different ways and more uh, conservation to help the people that were using the existing water. This is really a throwback of promises of federal money. Now, as to the specifics of your question as to what this money is going to be used for, what they've done is gone ahead and approved a project possibly behind closed doors violating the Open Meetings Act, whereby they say, we don't even know the cost of the projects. We don't even know the validity of whether or not the money that has been promised by the federal government will cover these projects and whether or not these projects are even worthwhile trying to do. But they have determined that we're going to take the next step in going ahead with these projects. There seems to be no foundation upon which these projects are being built and the promises that are being made. But what I hear all the time is, well, this is our water. We better dam it up and save it for ourselves or it'll just be used for other people. Well, that's exactly what Colorado is going to do. If this is going to be a race to see who can get the water first, we're going to lose that race too because <laughs> most of the water doesn't come from New Mexico. Yes. You know, so um, it's like using the very philosophy that's going to destroy us in the long run to manipulate the Gila River. And, you know, it's interesting. I was down at the Gila in Silver City two years ago. Do you know that in the 1800 barges from the Gulf of California used to come all the way up to Silver City no, delivering know. goods? Yeah. That's how vital the Gila River was. Yeah. It's, it's nothing anymore. That's how much we've destroyed these western waterways. And... Um, it, they're just going to keep getting destroyed with these water projects that may or may not work. So we know that gas prices are boom down. We know that uh, we're not going to get as much money to spend. Not that we think that the Republicans are going to have anything to propose to spend it on. But what is the impact of the, of, uh, the lowering of the taxes because of the lowering of gas prices? The result is huge. It's huge because this governor has had such a failed economic policy. The only thing that's kept us minimally afloat is oil and gas prices for the last uh, four years. And if you look at Albuquerque, Albuquerque economically is flat on its back. We have no real economic development in the state of New Mexico other than oil and gas right now. So if oil and gas collapses or stays collapsed for any amount of time, This could really undercut our last um, piece of economic viability if that's taken out from underneath us. Um, And when we, we say oil and gas, we have to remember that gas has already collapsed. New Mexico um, gas providers, mostly in the northwest section of the state, can't sell their gas. They've already been capping wells for five and six and seven years. It's oil and oil alone that kept the boom moving. And if that dies, then um, then the state is really in trouble. Uh, 
the number that people should remember is for every dollar a barrel of gas goes down, we lose $6 million to the state. So consequently, if it's gone down $50, you just you can do the math wow. and you know how much this is going to hurt. So if the price of gas stays down or oil stays down for any sustained period of time, we could have big troubles in the state of New Mexico, big troubles. So m might you briefly sort of outline what some of those troubles might might be and what the what the legislature might or might not do to try and address them? Well, of course, the big trouble will be uh, reducing funds to education, while at the same time we're giving away a billion dollars to private interest right. for testing. Right. It will be um, less economic development, which will cause greater tensions uh, on individual and families and will actually cause higher crime rates, which will increase the cost for prisons and jails because this governor surprisingly since she was a district attorney she should know better but she's 30 years behind in american um judicial reform and uh, corrections reform 35 other states have already started corrections reform they've reduced their recidivism rate they've increased public safety they've reduced crime and they have dramatically reduced the amount of money that goes into our prisons but we have done none of that she has vetoed every bill that we've gotten to her desk as it relates to criminal justice reform and corrections reform. And so consequently, those costs are gonna go up. In fact, we just had an LFC hearing last week where we had the Secretary of Corrections in front of us. And while everybody was being told that the governor wants to keep any increases in departments to 2%, the corrections came in and asked for four times that amount in increases. And John Arthur Smith, to his credit, asked the secretary, well, have you, has the governor approved this rate increase that you, on behalf of the executive branch, are asking for? And the secretary said, no, I have not. And John Arthur followed up and said, well, when was the last time you did talk to the governor? And the secretary of corrections couldn't even answer the question as to the last time he had seen the governor. So we don't even know who's making these budgets, and we don't even know how it's going to pan out in the end. So let me ask you a, a, a non-legislative qu question. We were talking beforehand about this Albuquerque School Board election. And uh, there's a real good chance that apparently the governor has a candidate in every one of the, are they called districts, I believe? Yeah. Um, uh, what, uh, what do you think is going to happen here? I mean, are they going to buy the school board election too? Well, traditionally, any election with small turnouts always favors the special interests. These school boards traditionally have we've had people spending five and six and seven thousand dollars that have been raised um, from friends and family and people in the neighborhood. But we are hearing that the governor, well, first of all, the governor has one candidate in each of these races, whereas many citizens have come forward and applied to these jobs because they're so interested in what's happening to our school and so appalled. But now you have five and six candidates opposed to the governor's reform and one governor candidate in the race oh, who wants to perpetrate oh, her reforms. So, um, and then on top of that, we fully expect her to do just what she did in the general election, spend obscene amounts of money um, misrepresenting candidates and their positions. We saw this in the 1980s, in, starting in San Diego, where Christian fundamentalists would come in, they would try not to answer what their positions were on the important issues, and then if they had to answer, they would answer the way that they thought uh, the constituents wanted, but then they just went ahead and did whatever they wanted afterwards. And so, consequently, will we get that kind of school board for APS, or will people come together in a very sophisticated way and choose their candidates closely based on, on has that person been in the community a long time? Has he been involved with the school systems for a long time? Do you clearly know where he stands or she stands on an issue? 
And will we get enough people out to vote to overcome the special interest money? Now, that election is in early February next year. So we all have to start to pay attention to it now. This has been a great conversation. I wonder if you had any sort of last last wrap-ups. I know we talked a lot about, about this being a very discouraging time uh, and a time of, of deep concerns. Um, I know you feel that way too, but I also know that you've sort of taken off the gloves and are ready to go because this is, this is the role you've suddenly got. Let me just say, I'm starting to do a lot of studying and a lot of reading about the best ideas to overcome corporate power in America and in New Mexico, how to get the grassroots energized and to how to get real reform done. And while, for the most part, I've always been, tried to be outspoken and upfront about where I stand, I've also always tried to compromise and gather consensus. But now I believe it's my turn to fight. And I am ready for the fight. I'm ready to bring it on. And I'm ready to stand up for what I believe and try to stop those things which don't uh, help my constituents and aren't in my constituents' best interest and my family and my daughter. So um, I'm ready for the fight. But at the same time, I'm studying, trying to get all the latest information about how we overcome this. It, this is going back to the 1880s in New Mexico, in, in America. The robber barons took control of the country then, and it was up to the progressive and the populist movements to overcome them. And they had a series of reforms that worked. And then um, uh, Teddy Roosevelt brought them in, many of those reforms, the antitrust reforms. Then they were crowned by um, Theodore Roosevelt and um, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who brought this country prosperity for 70 years and a huge expansion of American middle class, American traditional values, and uh, American uh, public education. And we need to go back to those traditional values and, and figure out how to overcome these latest um, power grabs by special interests. Cisco, thank you so very much. It's been a, it's been a real joy, Cisco. Thank you, VB. It's an honor.